So I'm Edward Slareland from UBC, University of British Columbia. And I'm also director of what's called CERC, C-E-R-C, the Cultural Evolution of Religion Research Consortium. This is basically a collection of partner institutions that are working on this uh, certain hypotheses about the cultural evolution of religion. And as a result of a grant we got from the Canadian government as part of a new program called the Partnership Grant Program. So the idea is uh, to attack large problems that one university can't do alone by getting a consortium of universities around the world together, a lot of interdisciplinary expertise. So it's centered, our network centered at UBC, uh, UBC and SFU. Then we have two senior partners, so Aarhus University in Denmark and Oxford University. And I'm discovering actually probably our biggest partner is Levna. <clears throat> so that's one of the reasons I'm out here is to meet with our uh, with Masaryk University partner and um, try to get everyone to know who's involved in the network and what their expertise is and what sort of projects people are working on. But the idea is to cobble together interdisciplinary expertise from around the world to to study the cultural evolution of religion. So our basic hypothesis is that you have uh, these raw materials for religious cognition, theory of mind, overprojection of intentionality onto the world. And that gives you the kind of supernatural beings and gods that you see in small scale religions. So ancestor gods, uh, gods in the forest who may or may not care about what you do. They're kind of capricious. Our, our basic hypothesis is that cultural evolution latched on to this basic raw material and put together a certain package of supernatural beliefs. So uh, morally concerned gods, so gods that aren't just powerful, but they care about pro-social norms. They care about how you treat other people in your group. Uh, gods that can surveil you. So they, they see what you do. In some cases, they can see not just what you do, but what you think and feel. So they can actually see your motivations and not just your, your behavior. And if you take those sort of supernatural beings and put them together with a package of cultural practices, so ritual practices where you're singing in unison, you're dancing in unison, you get a chance to uh, engage in physical synchrony with your co-religionists, which probably also gives you a chance to, to see if they're really genuine co-religionists or just kind of going through the motions. You get a package of cultural technologies like this it's a very powerful way for bringing about social cohesion. So our, our basic hypothesis is it's a very old one about the functional role of certain types of religions, that they tie groups together and allow them to cooperate in a way that you just can't get otherwise. And our basic, uh, the way we've pitched the fundamental importance of it is we really think religion's key for moving human beings from uh, small-scale foraging hunting, hunter and gatherer societies to these kind of large-scale societies that we live in now, where we're cooperating all the time with strangers. Uh, kin selection, reciprocal altruism isn't really enough to get that going. So we're, there's a bit of a puzzle about how human beings cooperate on these large-scale, uh, large scales with anonymous uh, one-off interactions. We're never going to see these people again. We think that the kind of values you get out of uh, religious belief and practice systems is the way that happens. So these, these theories go back to ancient China. I studied an early Confucian thinker who had very similar theories. Um, more recently in the West, you have people like Durkheim who have had theories like this. What's new about our approach is actually making these hypotheses empirically tractable. So putting them into a form that could be tested against data and then gathering large amounts of data from a variety of sources. So historical texts, experimental studies, ethnographic studies, neuroimaging studies, economic games, uh, mathematical modeling. We're also going to be doing uh, borrowing tools from evolutionary biology, so cladistic analysis, where you trace biological lines of descent and applying these tools to cultural evolution, so to the evolution of religion and looking at uh, the development of ritual forms or of texts using these cladistic tools that can show uh, uh, relations between things that may not obviously be related when you first look at them. So this is the, the new thing we're doing. We're taking old theories and testing them in very new ways and in ways that are very interdisciplinary. So bringing historians together with biologists, together with mathematicians and neuroscientists. 
So that's the new, the new aspect of the approach. There's a couple different projects I could talk about. So when it comes to theory of mind, so this idea we have about theory of mind as a raw material for religious cognition, there's been a lot of contemporary work on theory of mind. So experimental work looking at uh, theory of mind and how it's related to people's praying when they're praying to, let's say, the Christian God as opposed, in a personal way, as opposed to uh, doing it in a, uh, reciting a, a prayer that's more formulaic. So this is work that Ufa Schutt at Aarhus has done. Uh, one of the new ways we want to look at this is, is actually draw on what uh, Luther Martin has called data from dead minds. So psychologists, people, most people who work on cognitive science of religion have been studying contemporary subjects because that's what psychologists do. They're mostly coming out of psychology and anthropology. So they're working with living subjects. What we're hoping to do with the historical component of our team is actually uh, open up all this data from texts and archaeology that has not been explored in the cognitive science of religion quite as much. And that's partly for disciplinary reasons. So anthropologists and psychologists just don't know how to deal with texts. They don't really uh, understand what you can get out of texts, I think. Um, and it's partly just because uh, there's been no way to get beyond sort of the ad hoc approaches that we use in the humanities. So in the humanities, we uh, scientists sometimes think humanists just make things up. But we have our own standards of evidence. We have ways we interpret texts. But typically, it's, uh, very, it's qualitative and somewhat ad hoc. So I have a theory that there, a theory you'll hear in my field is that the early Chinese don't have mind-body dualism. So ancient Chinese, sometimes people claim in East Asia in general, you don't have mind-body dualism. And that would be a big problem for our theory. If it's the case that some people essentially don't have theory of mind or don't believe in a difference between bodies and minds, that would be a problem for a lot of basic theories in cognitive science of religion. Now, the way in the humanities this debate usually takes place is uh, my opponents say, look at these five passages, which seem to suggest that the Chinese don't distinguish between mind and body. And I say, aha. But look at these five, where you really see it very strongly. And you basically have people cherry picking passages that fit their interpretation of their argument. Now, there's an implicit assumption that my passages are better than your passages, that mine are more representative, or they reveal something more profound about the tradition. But we ha we've lacked tools for doing large scale, more rigorous quantitative assessments of texts. So one of our main initiatives is getting scholars in the humanities, historians, to approach their texts using these new computerized tools. Whether it's, quali so qual it could be just qualitative analysis where you've essentially got uh, old fashioned qualitative reading of text going on, but by teams of coders. So you can actually use intercoder reliability measures to see whether or not people are interpreting things in a consistent way. Uh, it could mean using some of these new automated tools to do uh, word frequency counts, or probably more interesting co-occurrence, so when you see certain terms occurring together. There's also increasingly sophisticated tools for doing semantic analysis, so you can actually go through large amounts of text uh, in an automated way and get some sense of the semantic content of the text. So this is very early days in text analysis, and. Uh, one of the goals in the first two years is just to figure out what tools are available, what they're good for, how you use them. But our goal is to get historians to learn about these tools and start using them, and then start interrogating our questions about the evolution of religion using these, these new technologies. So I think that's one of the more exciting aspects of the project, is, is combining approaches that have always been very common in the sciences, uh, large amounts of data, Scientists are aware that there's bias, you have qualitative biases. You try to overcome them through large amounts of data, uh, intercoder reliability measures, and statistics. You know, so you just you churn through enough data and the biases get washed out. And we're trying to take those, that insight and those techniques and apply them to textual interpretation. Current projects, one that uh, I'm hopefully starting up in the next couple weeks that we're doing the groundwork for now, is uh, looking at the contours of mind-body dualism using the medium of ghost stories. So we're going to be collecting in ancient China. So the nice thing about China, this is my specialty. So I, my old job was an early China expert. 
now I'm not sure what I am, but I used to be a historian of early China, early Chinese thought. Uh, China is great because we have this continuous written record from very early times down to contemporary times that's essentially the same language. It's all written in classical Chinese and it's a fairly continuous record. So what we're going to do is go through the entire historical record sampling from different centuries. This is what we're, my RAs are working on right now and assembling a collection of ghost stories. So uh, people, ghosts appearing in dreams, ghosts appearing in real life and having coders talk about what are the qualities of these ghosts. Can they see things? Can they hear things? And it's adapting techniques used by anthropologists like Emma Cohen with contemporary subjects, but now using it to apply to historical texts. So we can get, and what we're going to see, I think, is a kind of contour of mind-body dualism. Ghosts can still know things, they can still hear and see things, but they don't get hungry. They don't have to go to the bathroom. They, there are certain things that they, qualities they don't have that probably they don't have because people feel like those adhere to the body. They don't go with you when you die. And what I think the result is going to be and what we're seeing already in some of the pilots is a, uh, an outline of what mind-body dualism looks like at different periods in Chinese history. And then once we've done this with Chinese materials, we're going to start doing it with ancient Greek materials and uh, other textual traditions that go back. So I think what we're starting to assemble right now is a, is a large-scale uh, contour map of mind-body dualism in different cultures throughout historical time. And it's, it, what it looks like so far is it, it varies from culture to culture. It varies over time. But there's always a kind of basic uh, mind-body dualism that you can discern as a constant signal through all these different contours that suggests that it really is a, a human universal. So that's one ongoing project. We also have on the experimental side, we're building on the work that Ara Noren Zion's done with religious primes and cooperation. So if, if our hypothesis is correct, priming concepts of, let's say, the Christian God and subjects' minds is gonna cause them to act in a more pro-social way. And Ara has been getting at this by having people unscramble sentences that either have religious connotations or not, and seeing how they perform in economic games. The way we want to expand this is to make it cross-cultural, so take this approach to small-scale societies all over the world. So this is Ara teaming up with Joe Henrik and taking this to field sites around the world. And the sites that we've chosen are, I think, helpful because what you have is uh, uh, the local small-scale gods. So we're, we're doing this in places where people believe in these local spirits who are not pro-social. They don't really care about what you do. But then on top of that, you have the missionary religion that's come in, whether it's Islam or Christianity. So they also believe, or Buddhism, so they also believe in some world religion that's been brought in. And we're going to differentially prime local gods, uh, world religion gods, and possibly secular institutions if they exist and see how that affects their behavior in economic games, if it makes them more pro-social. So we're taking techniques that were piloted in Vancouver with the usual undergraduate research population, which is the subject of most psychological experiments, and, and taking it out in the field and, and applying it to radically diverse subject pools. So that's exciting as well. And that's one of the ways the, the partnership structure is so important because one of the things we're doing is tying together people who have these great field sites all over the world. So we've been working in Fiji, which is good for exploring certain types of questions. We have Demetrius here at Levna, who's got his field site in Mauritius, which is structurally in terms of the religions that are active in people's minds. It's very similar to Fiji, so it's a great comparison point. And rather than uh, people having to create a whole new field site somewhere that would be interesting. What we're trying to do is make people's field sites available to each other so they can either tag on new protocols or at least tag on to the groundwork that's been done in preparing the field site and get psychologists. Uh, and I've talked about the problems with humanities uh, scholars. There's a problem with psychologists if they, is that all of their results are based on North American university undergraduates. All of the subjects in you know, universal human cognition is based on these 20-year-old first-year psychology students in the United States. 
uh, we're trying, you know, and my colleagues have written a paper about this called The Weirdest People in the World, where they've just documented that North American university undergraduates are the weirdest subset of the weirdest group of people who are the weirdest subset of another weird group of people who has ever lived on a lot of different measures, even basic things like perception. So we're trying to get psychologists beyond weird people by getting them out into the field. And my colleagues, especially Joe Henrich, has really pioneered this. And so um, for psychologists, we're hoping to make this a more common practice. If you want to explore religious cognition, let's not just look at your subject pool you have at your local university. Let's go out into the field and look at real people around the world. So the overarching hypothesis is that uh, large-scale religions, world religions, are unique in having this cultural package of uh, supernatural surveillance, morally concerned gods, moral realism, and costly ritual practices. So ritual practices that involve costs that uh, signal something to others that you're part of the group. Our basic hypothesis is that people who are either members of these types of religions or possibly even primed with these types of ideas will behave in a more pro-social way. That's the basic hypothesis, both in contemporary populations and that we'll find this in the historical record, that when you have religions like this arising, this is going to co-occur with larger and larger uh, societies. So you get larger, more cohesive societies when you have these sorts of ideas. Uh, there's all sorts of sub-hypotheses that come out of this, um, one of which has to do with, let's say, the raw materials. So uh, we're going to hypothesize that some sort of mind-body dualism and theory of mind is a human cognitive universal. You find it throughout uh, human populations as far back as we have records and that it's this theory of mind that's undergirding basic religious perception. So it's theory of mind that allows people to think of gods and think about supernatural beings. Um, another sub-hypothesis is uh, there's going to be a distinction between, let's say, two different types of values. So the philosopher Charles Taylor has talked about what he calls strong versus weak evaluations. Uh, weak evaluation is I prefer chocolate ice cream to vanilla ice cream. There's nothing, it's an opinion. I don't get angry if you disagree with me. I don't feel a need to make you eat the type of ice cream that I like, it's just an opinion. Another type of evaluation we make is what he calls a strong evaluation. I think that child slavery is wrong. And this is psychologically distinct in the sense that I think I get angry if you don't agree with me. I want to impose my values upon you. I don't say, well, if you, you like child slavery, go ahead. You know, it's, you're different from me. Uh, so Taylor calls this uh, weak versus strong. Most people in moral psychology talk about it as the moral versus conventional distinction. So we have conventional judgments about what it's okay to wear, <clears throat> how it's okay to act at a dinner party, but we don't moralize them. We don't have punitive sentiments. Uh, and crucially, and this is the part that links up with our hypotheses, we don't think that our, our conventional judgments tell us anything real about the world. So I don't think, I realize that a uh, certain style of jeans that I wore in the 1970s in the United States looks silly. But I don't think that that actually reveals the structure of the universe. I realize it's just a sort of fashion trend. When we talk about slavery being wrong, we don't think about this as some sort of cultural belief we happen to have. We think of it as something we've discovered, a truth about the universe we've discovered. So one of our hypotheses is that uh, the pro-social bonding that you get from religions is because they ground a certain class of beliefs that we can call strong evaluations or moral beliefs. So uh, one of the things we want to look at is if it's actually the case that you find this distinction throughout cultures around the world, if you do, we want to see if it's actually the case that the distinctive feature of this class of judgments we call moral is that at some level they're connected to metaphysical beliefs. Now in most traditional religions, it's very explicit. So God said you can't do this. God said this is wrong. Um, it's part of the law of karma. 
you have very explicit supernatural grounding. Uh, one of the more maybe controversial aspects of, of our, this hypothesis, uh, again, this is grounded in Charles Taylor's work, is that modern secular, quote unquote, secular societies seem to have gotten past this. So there's this idea that now we ground our moral judgments in just the facts, just in rationality and a clear-eyed view of the world. Um, Taylor argues that that's really deceptive. And actually, if you look, if you poke moral beliefs, even in, in secular philosophers, you find metaphysical beliefs uh, hovering around back there. So why is slavery wrong or why is child slavery wrong? Well, because people have dignity, people have human rights. That's not a, it's not a scientific discovery. It's not a fact about the world. It's actually a belief. You can't uh, x-ray someone and show their human rights. And Taylor does a great job of tracing the origin of these beliefs in Christianity. So the proximate cause of it is, is the Christian tradition where the theological language gets stripped out. But Taylor's claim, and it's a strong one, is that no one can escape living in a set of moral beliefs like this, and that they're always going to be grounded in metaphysical beliefs, which would mean that, in a sense, people cannot not be religious at some level. If you expand religion to include these kind of very diffuse beliefs in things like human rights and human dignity. So one of the things we want to explore is whether or not it is the case that there's this unique class of claims that are grounded in metaphysical beliefs. Um, and if that's true, whether or not there, things like human entities, like human rights, are functionally identical to beliefs in things like God's will or the law of karma. So that's, uh, that's something we want to explore experimentally. So we actually want to get uh, atheists and uh, really, and not just uh, college undergraduate atheists or kind of wishy-washy atheists, but we want real full-grown adult thought-out atheists and see if through behavioral measures we can show that actually uh, their metaphysical beliefs are causing them to react in ways that we would predict when it comes to uh, when we threaten certain metaphysical beliefs that they hold. So one of the, uh, as I see it, one of the functions of our research consortium is to bring together people who have been working on precisely these questions, but sometimes in isolation from one another. So here at Levna, people are working in the embodiment cluster and in the prosociality cluster in particular on essentially sub-questions of our hypothesis. So they've been working on projects that are very much related to projects we're, we're working on as well at UBC and that our partners at Aarhus are working on in Denmark. So the, one of the roles of Levna is, uh, is strengthening our approach by bringing in new personnel by enriching our approaches. Uh, so in many cases, we're, we're looking at the same problem in slightly different ways. And I, I'm already getting the sense that some of the approaches you're using here could be very helpful. But the goal is to eliminate uh, people uh, repeating other work that's been done, which in some cases, we're struggling to start up projects that you already have well underway here. Um, so reduce wasted effort and also get people communicating in various ways. So we're hoping to have exchange of personnel, postdocs, graduate students, and faculty between our partner institutions, so between Levna and UBC, that'll help pe keep people up to date about what other partner institutions are working on and avoid uh, duplication of effort and wasted effort. So religious studies as an academic discipline is relatively recent. You don't get religious studies departments, in, at least in the States, until the 1960s, which is quite late. And one of the reasons for that is this idea that religion is not worth studying because it's going away. So we're, we're all becoming secular, religion will fade away, maybe become a quaint practice people do in their spare time. And this attitude informs policy making. So uh, politicians act as if people around the world are motivated by uh, basic type of secular motivations. And if you see people using religious language, it's actually a smokescreen for other motives. So uh, there's, a, there's a kind of blind spot when it comes to genuine relig religious motivation. So one of our collaborators on the grant is Scott Atrin, who's been arguing for a long time that you can't understand Middle Eastern politics unless you see that people 
are being motivated by what he calls sacred values, but they're essentially values that are grounded in deeply held religious beliefs that are qualitatively distinct from other types of values. And that's crucial because the important thing about a sacred value is it can't be weighed against other values. You can't buy it away, you can't trade it away. And unless you see that, you don't understand the dynamics in the region. So I've been, I've actually been arguing in Canada, uh, there's been this, uh, the press coverage about the recent videos of the Prophet and the protests around the world about these videos have had the general tenor of, well, there must be something else going on here. So these protests are really a screen for anti-Americanism and then people are using this particular incident as an excuse to vent their anti-Americanism, which has economic reasons. It's gotta have some other motivation going on in the background. And I think the problem with that is people don't realize that a lot of people are genuinely angry about their religious beliefs being insulted. People are still motivated by sacred values in a way that most policy makers are, are, think are not aware of. So they're, they're important, uh, the role of religion in binding people together into coherent units is one of the things we've, I've talked about today, but the flip side of that is how uh, this binding people together into effective units also creates an outgroup. So religious coop the flip side of religious cooperation is religious violence and religious hatred. And unless you understand those dynamics, you can't understand what's going on in the world today. So we actually have a public policy aspect of our grant. So we have public policy experts on board as collaborators, and we're hoping to translate the results of our research into concrete suggestions for policymakers in Canada and around the world. So I think religion, we know much more about uh, how Shakespearean sonnets were composed than we know about why someone would be a suicide bomber or why someone would set themselves on fire in, in protest. Uh, and I think you need to under, these are actually important questions and we don't understand them very well. So I think actually this, the questions we're exploring are not just of academic interest, they're actually crucial for understanding the contemporary world.